2022 was a strange year, not just for gaming, but for my life in general. There were a ton of changes in my life, most of them good, thankfully. So most of my time has been dedicated to actually touching grass and just living my life, which is why I haven't uploaded any videos in months other than a podcast that no one really cares about. For anybody wondering where I've been, don't worry. Everything has been great, and I've just been focusing on other things that make me happy. But there was one video that I simply could not skip out on, which is the traditional Game of the Year video. Of course, one of those things that really made me happy this year was gaming, and lots of it. However, it wasn't really perfect, because 2022 gaming-wise was really strange, because it doesn't really feel like the next generation of gaming is truly here. And yes, we do have new consoles, but most of the AAA games I played were very predictable and boring and didn't really feel like an advancement. In fact, the consoles kind of feel like when you upgrade your PC to a nicer graphics card. That's kind of what it feels like. The jump didn't really feel that big. It just felt like a slight upgrade. Most of my favorite games were just PS5 upgrades of older games. You know, that should really tell you a lot. It felt like most AAA games were hiding behind those pretty looking graphics in order to justify their total lack of creativity and drive to do anything different than the safe path of copying other things that were more successful before. I was severely disappointed with this year's lineup of AAA games because it felt like making money was more important than quality. All of them felt the same to me, but when it comes to smaller companies and independent developers, they really hit it out of the park in my opinion. Most of the games in my Game of the Year list are from smaller developers, with a few exceptions, and that's really saying something. It made me really happy, and it was even inspiring to see most of my favorite games from this year be created by either one person or small teams of truly creative people that don't feel like everything needs to be a Hollywood-style Marvel movie. But anyway, enough of that. Let's just get into listing out good games that I liked this year. As is tradition, I'm going to list out the honorable mentions first before getting to my top 10. All of these are games that I played or at least tried out that I really enjoyed, and I just wanted to give them a shout out. Now, within these honorable mentions, I have a subcategory that I like to call games that definitely would have been in my top 10, but they're not because I didn't have enough time to play them, sorry. The first one on that list is Elden Ring. Yes, everyone and their mother and their dog and their cat and their fish has been praising, almost worshipping this game as the perfect open world Souls game. I have personally never really been all that interested in Souls-like games, but I do recognize that they are very much beloved and they look really fun, at least when I watch other people play it, it looks really fun. But Elden Ring always looked fun and like reviews, gameplay footage, like that game in particular seemed like something that I would really like. I always had all of the intentions in the world to play it for myself, but I just never got around to it. Of course, you don't need me to remind you that the game is awesome, but it would just feel wrong for me to include this game in my top 10 without actually playing it. If I had played it, I don't think I would have doubted for a second to include it on here, but it's an honorable mention instead. Sorry. The next one is God of War Ragnarok. Just like Elden Ring, everyone's been talking about it, and I'm sure you already know what you feel about it. I, however, have a lot of conflicting feelings when it comes to the God of War reboot in general. I think they're good games in general, but I think they're terrible God of War games. I feel like if they just reskinned it to have original characters and stuff instead of just Kratos, I would probably really like these games a lot more than I actually do now. Because I've always preferred the older God of War titles, so this new, slower, very Last of Us style of God of War always rubbed me the wrong way. But even with those thoughts in my mind, I can't deny that the quality is through the roof and it can be entertaining in its own way to just let the spectacle take you away and just enjoy a really, really cool looking thing. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to really deep dive into Ragnarok, so I can't in good conscience include it on my list. The last two games I want to mention are Soul Hackers 2 and Star Ocean The Divine Force. From the moment these games were announced, I wanted them both, despite what the reviews said for Soul Hackers 2. Some people said it was kind of alright and not really all that good. I, I still wanted it. I love Shin Megami Tensei, and I've always wanted to get into Star Ocean as well. 
but unfortunately my parents bought both of those games for me on PlayStation 5, and I can't open them up until Christmas. <laughs> by the time you guys watch this video, I'm definitely going to be playing the hell out of both games, but by then it'll be way too late for me to add them to the list or to say anything meaningful about them. This Game of the Year video is definitely going to be finished and uploaded by the time any of that happens. So yeah, I just wanted to give these two games a shout out and give them a preemptive thumbs up. And there you go, that concludes my list of games that definitely would have been in my top 10, but they're not because I didn't have enough time to play them, sorry. And now, here are the rest of my honorable mentions. Arcade Paradise, Bayonetta 3, Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, Pokemon Legends Arceus, Sonic Frontiers, Horizon Forbidden West, Sifu, Oli Oli World, Dying Light 2, Getsu Fumaden Undying Moon, The King of Fighters 15, Monarch, Shadow Warrior 3, Rune Factory 5, Ghostwire Tokyo, Kirby Discovery, or Kirby and the Forgotten Land if you prefer crappier titles, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, Advance Wars 1 and 2 Remake, Nintendo Switch Sports, Salt and Sacrifice, Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hopes, The Klonoa 1 and 2 Remakes, Euden Chronicle Rising, Moss Book 2, Unpacking, Power Wash Simulator, Pac-Man World Repack, Neon White, Red Out, Cult of the Lamb, RPG Time The Legend of Right, Tinykin, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle R, Temtem, Splatoon 3, Shovel Knight Dig, Harvestella, Pentiment, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, Warhammer 40k Darktide, Dragon Quest Treasures, one shot the console versions and finally call of duty modern warfare 2. these are all of the games that i played this year that i thought were either pretty good or at least enjoyable enough to mention them i know there's some games like pokemon in here that got into controversy because it didn't run very well on switch and whatever i mean i enjoyed those games just fine i can obviously explain myself with a lot of these games here but that's not the point i just wanted to shout them out a little bit I apologize if I missed your personal favorite, but I am just one guy, and I can't play every single little thing out there. In fact, when I was building my list, I was actually kind of shocked that I actually played this many games this year. My time has been very limited lately with a lot of the changes that have been going on in my life, so I'm surprised that I was able to experience so much. But yeah, I guess a lot can happen in a year. <laughs> Goddamn. Anyway, let's move on to the big ones. My personal top 10 games of 2022. Let me remind you all that this is just my own personal and highly subjective list. This is just my opinion and I have no authority over anyone in any way. Just because I like certain games that doesn't force you in any way that you have to like them too or anything. You're free to disagree. I know the kind of games that I like for me. I know what works for me and I never feel like I need to give in to the pressure and just pick the popular thing. And besides, I already mentioned God of War and Elden Ring, and I acknowledge that they're good games. Go play both. There you go. Your opinion has been reinforced and validated. So now let me have my opinion for a little bit. If the only thing you wanted from this video is to get a reminder that the game that you already know you like is in fact good, then there you go. There's your reminder. All 10 of these games, in my opinion, are awesome. It doesn't matter what order they are in, just because a game is at number 4, it doesn't mean that it's like objectively better than number 7 or whatever. All of them are great, and I recommend all 10 of them, so don't get too hung up on the numbers and just enjoy the video, alright? Let's begin. Actually, before we begin, this is me from the future telling you that I've decided to add an 11th game onto my list. It's surprising how even in December, right when the year is about to end, there's still a bunch of notable games coming out that are worth talking about. But one of them was so good that I decided to make an exception and add it onto my Game of the Year list as an 11th entry. And that game is Witch on the Holy Night. I have mentioned in the past that I was seriously looking forward to this game. This is a very old visual novel that's been out for a decade in Japan, but never got an English release date until now. If any of you were curious about the Fate franchise, Melty Blood, Tsukihime, or anything from Type Moon, then you must pay attention to this game, because it's essentially the precursor to all of that. In my opinion, it's a valuable part of our gaming history, and it's a massively big deal that it's finally coming over to the West. And I'm glad to say that it delivers on all fronts. Witch on the Holy Knight is possibly one of the best visual novels I have ever played so far. 
there's no traditional gameplay here. You're not running around in a big open world, you're not fighting or shooting anything or doing online death matches. It's just a great story with great characters. This is not like normal visual novels where you just have two cardboard cutouts of characters talking back and forth with a generic background. They really go out of their way to make a lot of art. It really does feel like you're watching an anime or something that is truly cinematic and dynamic. It doesn't feel like I'm just sitting there reading the story. I'm watching things unfold in a really natural way. Especially now where the game has been remastered and improved upon by offering higher resolution art, voice acting, a better sounding soundtrack, and of course an official English localization for all of us here at this neck of the woods. With the exception of a few spelling mistakes and grammatical errors here and there, the translation is surprisingly good, and I think most people will be happy with it, even with me, because I complain about localizations and translations all the time. If any of you care even a little bit about seeing good stories in video games, if you're curious about getting into the Fate universe, or you just want to know why this old ass game from 2012 is such a big deal, then I highly, highly recommend you give this game a chance. It's only 20 hours, so for visual novel standards it's pretty short, and you don't have to know anything prior to be able to get into this. As I said, this is pretty much just the embryo that gives birth to all of the fate-related things that people love so much these days. So there will not be a more perfect opportunity than this one to experience one of the greatest and most iconic visual novels ever made. Okay, I said my piece. Now I will pass the microphone on to myself from the past, from the previous recording, to continue talking about the other 10 games that I like this year. See ya. This game is insanity and I love it. From the same guy that made Devil Daggers, Hyper Demon is the amazing follow-up that came seemingly out of nowhere. It could have been very easy to have the same mechanics, make a new level, and just slap a number 2 on it, and there you go. Easy money, Devil Daggers 2. But no, the developers went above and beyond to take everything that Devil Daggers did and flip it on its head, almost literally. There's so much more to the shooting that allows for more experimentation. The enemies are more complex, the timer is completely different from Devil Daggers, and of course the visuals are unlike anything I have ever seen before. This is pretty much the only game other than Splatoon that actually puts an active effort in pushing the shooter genre forward with creative new ways to play. Hyper Demon has this unique field of view that almost looks like a fisheye lens that lets you see more of your surroundings. And it also has this really funky overlay that lets you see what's behind you, in addition to all of the slow motion and all of the different tricks that you can do with just two different shooting styles. It's truly a unique experience that's always a joy to play. You can either figure out all that stuff on your own, or you can do these really handy tutorials that teach you in detail how to do everything. It's really great. I've spent so much time retrying and retrying over and over again, just getting addicted to trying out different things, different tricks, seeing other people's replays and refining every new run. If you think that every single shooting game is just the same thing, then you haven't played Hyper Demon. Go play it. It's pretty amazing. It's also super cheap and it doesn't really take a whole lot of your time. Number 9, Proteus. And no, I'm not talking about the indie game Proteus with a T that's really chill and colorful and nice. No, I'm talking about Proteus with a D. Now that we're on the topic of shooters, let's talk about one that I was surprised to fall in love with. Proteus had been in early access for a while, but it finally released in full this year, and I played it on Game Pass. I knew that it was another Doom clone in a seemingly infinite ocean of Doom clones, so I wasn't expecting a whole lot, but I saw enough positive reviews that made me want to give it a chance. The fact that it ended up in my Game of the Year list should make it pretty obvious that I did in fact end up loving it. Proteus is a great game that is seemingly inspired more by Doom 2016 than it is the original Doom. It does have a similar structure in terms of the enemies, how you traverse levels, and even down to needing to collect like red and blue and yellow keys to open doors. You have the equivalent of the Kaka Demon, you have the equivalent of the Pink Demon, you have the equivalent of the Imp that shoots stuff at you. You can tell it's very much a Doom game without actually being a Doom game. It even has an auto map, which looks exactly the same as the modern Doom games. So yeah, it's a pretty shameless blend of both classic Doom and modern Doom but I think it actually works quite well. I think Proteus does enough to set itself apart while also feeling familiar. This is especially so when factoring in its unique art style. 
I love the way that everything moves and animates in the way that it does. And the graphics look really nice, especially when it's raining. It just feels like a super elaborate mod. When traversing the levels, everything makes sense and it's super fun to look for secrets. I always love it when I play these kinds of games where I go through so much of the level and then I end up circling back around all the way back to the beginning or going back the way I came. It's just this whole thing where the levels just make their way back around full circle and I end up finding secrets and places. I, it's just so, so cool. It, it feels like I'm playing a regular Doom game. I think a good Doom clone doesn't just look like Doom, but also has a similar design philosophy in terms of how the levels are laid out. And Proteus does that very well. Even without those things, the game just feels really good to play. Even with a gamepad, I know that your instinct would be to just go mouse and keyboard and don't change from there, but I've actually been playing with an Xbox One controller almost exclusively, and it's been pretty comfortable so far. And that's mostly because the auto-aim is super broken. You just aim down sights and the, the camera just, whoop, just immediately moves towards the enemy. It's super easy to aim with just the default auto-aim. And uh, I really don't have a problem. It's <laughs> kind of comfortable. It's really, uh, it's definitely a lot easier to play the game that way with a controller. But yeah, with mouse and keyboard is also pretty legitimate and awesome, but I like playing it with a gamepad, and it's just really comfy that way. I know I'm talking in a pretty surface level way about this game, but it's just one of those games that you have to feel out for yourself to truly understand why it's so great. I think you did a really good job if you can have me say the line, Hey, I want to play Proteus, right? Uh, usually I would say something like, hey, that one Doom clone over there, right? That rep off of that other game, right? When you don't really call it by its proper name, you just say, oh yeah, that, that, that Doom game, that, that thing, that's like the other thing. No. With this one, I say, I want to play Proteus. I want to play Proteus specifically, you know? Talking about it in its own terms without feeling the need to invoke the other game that is inspired by is usually a good sign. I highly recommend Proteus, especially if you're a Doom fan and if you have Game Pass, you're gonna have a great time. Number eight, Live Alive. I've already played through Live Alive a long time ago through a fan translation on Super Nintendo, but I was still delighted to play through it again in what is essentially a remake with nicer graphics, newer music, voice acting, and a UI overhaul. So yeah, I am kind of cheating by including a game that I already played years ago. However, this game never came out in the West until just barely this year and there's enough changes involved that it felt new all over again, so I'm gonna count it. That and, as I said, it's been a very long time since I last played this game and I could barely remember anything about it at this point, so yeah, it might as well have been a new game for me. There really isn't a whole lot to say about Live Alive that hasn't been said already a million times by fans of the original, myself included. All I can say is that it's just a better version of that old SNES game. It got the Octopath Traveler treatment, and it looks gorgeous. The voice acting, both in English and Japanese, are pretty entertaining. And the different stories you can play through all throughout time are just as good as I remember them. I don't want to spoil anything, but rest assured that this is a must-play for any JRPG fan. If you knew about this game, but you never played it because it was never officially released over here, then now is the time, because Live Alive is a classic, and I think you owe it to yourself to at least give it a shot. Number 7, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. Speaking of older games being remade, hey, Crisis Core. One of the most beloved games in the compilation of Final Fantasy VII was released on the PSP years ago. It was a little rough around the edges, and that combat system took a little bit of time to get used to, but everybody remembers it fondly despite its flaws. Just like with Final Fantasy VII Remake, people have been asking for a Crisis Core remake since forever. When we finally got the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I knew it was only a matter of time before a Crisis Core remake was announced. And now it's here! And very late into the year, I was waiting until the last possible moment to be able to play as much as I could before deciding if I wanted to include it in my Game of the Year list. And I'm glad I did that, because it definitely deserves a spot. I placed this game next to Live Alive because both are basically the exact same thing, in terms of them being older games that got some improvements and a fresh coat of paint. It doesn't sound like much, but believe me, it makes a huge difference. Pretty much everything about Crisis Core Reunion is better than the original PSP game. The graphics are better, the music is awesome, and even the combat. I think that's probably the most important part with this little slot machine kind of system. The combat is so much more fun here, it's a little bit more akin to Final Fantasy VII Remake, and yeah, it's a night and day difference to how it was before. It went through a lot of changes, but at its core, no pun intended, it is still the same cringy but very charming Crisis Core. I loved it on PSP, and I still love it now on the modern consoles. So, if that's you, then hey, go ahead and grab this. 
Number 6. Dragon Quest X Offline Did you think I was done talking about old new games? Well, fear not, because the next game in my list is the offline version of a Japanese exclusive remaster of an MMORPG for the Nintendo Wii. Yeah, you heard me. Dragon Quest X is one of my favorite MMOs to play, and that's really saying something from somebody that doesn't really like to play multiplayer games a whole lot. I have it on my Nintendo Switch through my Japanese account, and I've had a great time with it. However, the language barrier does make it a little difficult to fully get into it. When Square Enix announced the offline version of Dragon Quest X, I got really excited. I figured this would be a way to let people experience the story of Dragon Quest X without having to get people to commit to a new MMO or to have to pay for more servers for other countries. I figured that this would be the way we would finally get the game in English, and then the game came out, but only in Japan. And so far, at the time of this recording, there is no English version announced. So yeah, you can add that to the pile of other really good Dragon Quest games that never came out in the West. I was obviously frustrated about this, but I said screw it! I decided to go ahead and buy the game on Switch anyway with my Japanese account. And honestly, I don't regret it at all. I have adored my time with Dragon Quest X Offline, even if it means pointing my phone at the screen with Google Translate on it so I know what's going on. Just like Live Alive and just like Crisis Core, Dragon Quest X is the older Wii game, but remastered and with no internet connection required. The characters got all chibi-fied, which a lot of people complained about, but I stopped caring about that a long time ago. I got over it very quickly. Everything else looks better, sounds better, is voice acted, and the map and systems have been overhauled to fit the single player experience so much better. And honestly, outside of the character models being better in the MMO, I think I prefer the offline version. It's just so much fun to play this as a regular single player Dragon Quest game, even in Japanese. If you've played other Dragon Quest games before, then you should have a pretty good idea how this one works as well. There's big bad guy, you go off on an adventure to try to beat him up and you level up. Typical classic RPG stuff. But now you have to factor in a little bit more of the MMO side of things by choosing your character race, your class, customizing your character based on like what weapons you want to use and just a whole bunch more stuff. I really love how they adapted the MMO parts into this single player game to the point that it makes me want more MMOs to do the same thing, right? Why don't you have an offline version for most MMOs? Just have an offline version of like Final Fantasy XIV or something where you can experience the story without having the game disappear when the server shut down. Maybe then we wouldn't have to lose every single free-to-play game that doesn't do well, right? You wouldn't want to lose all of that stuff to time, so make an offline version of it. But hey, whatever. That's a rant for another time. I digress. I loved Dragon Quest X. And I know it's not over yet, because they'll eventually release DLC expansions that adds more story to it, which of course is the same expansions from the regular MMO, so I'm looking forward to continuing to play this game. I really, really want this game to come out in English, but for now, I'm happy enough with my Japanese copy. It was a little expensive, but at this point, it's worth the money. I've already spent so many hours on it. Number 5, The Legend of Heroes Trails from Zero. Okay, I swear this is the last old new game that I talk about. Are you starting to realize why I found 2022 so disappointing? A large amount of my favorite games this year were just old ass Japanese RPGs that just got remastered to look and sound better. Some of these games took forever to come over to the West, and one of them still hasn't come over yet. However, I believe this game is one that truly deserves to not only have an official Western release, but to also land a spot on my game of the year list and that is, of course, The Legend of Heroes, Trials from Zero. I feel like every year I have a Legend of Heroes game on here, but that's because all of them are just that good. If any of you follow my channel in any way, then you already know that I spent a long time playing through the fan-translated version of the game on stream from beginning to end. I loved it so much that I actually went through the trouble of buying the official release and playing a significant portion of that too. But by the time that happened, my mind had already been made up. Trails from Zero is an excellent entry in the Legend of Heroes series. It was one that people had been asking for for a long time. 
There was a lot of lore and characters that we as fans were missing out on because the Crossbell games never made it to the West. We got the Cold Steel games that take place a little bit after those games. And I think one of those games takes place at the same time as one of these Crossbell games. So storyline wise, things got a little confusing because we had these games that we needed to play and we just never got them. There was a giant hole in our knowledge that needed to be filled. And we finally got at least one half of it this year. Next year, we're going to get the other half. What can I say about Trails from Zero that I haven't said a million times during my live streams? It's an amazing game. It has everything that you could ever want from a Legend of Heroes game, such as fantastic world building, great characters to interact with, great dialogue writing. I love the banter between all the characters and a fun RPG experience with a ton of stuff to do. I saw on the internet that a normal playthrough would take about 30 to 35 hours, but for me, I ended up playing this thing for 100 hours and I still don't think I've seen everything this game has to offer. It has a seemingly boundless amount of dialogue from characters that you genuinely want to know more about. And not just main characters, like random NPCs all throughout the city that have their own little stories to tell. And the combat has the usual orbman system that allows you to experiment and try out different character builds. The music is probably one of the best in the series, and all of the smaller scale, intimate moments stick out to me so much more than the larger story at play. Having Japanese voices alongside a higher resolution, turbo mode, and better frame rate makes this the best that this old PSP game will probably ever look. Some of my favorite characters in the entire franchise are in this game, and Crossbell has become one of my favorite places to visit in The Legend of Heroes. The fact that I was more than happy to play through this game again almost immediately after finishing 100 hours of the fan-translated Geofront version should be a testament to how incredibly good this game is. If you have even a passing interest in narratively driven games, RPGs, or you're just really interested in good world building with characters that you're going to end up knowing better than your actual friends in real life, then you owe it to yourself to play Trails from Zero. It's that good. I never thought that I would ever be able to replicate that same magic that I felt when I played Trails in the Sky on the PSP for the first time. But with playing Trails from Zero, I kind of felt it again. And I think that really means something. It's an awesome game. Go check it out. Number four, Midnight Fight Express. Okay, as I promised, we're finally gonna talk about new games now. No more remasters. Midnight Fight Express is fucking awesome. Made by just one guy, it's basically one of the most fun beat-em-ups I've played in a good long while. I always hear this opinion flying around on the internet these days that beat-em-up games don't work anymore, that it's an outdated genre that worked well in arcades and retro consoles like the Sega Genesis or whatever, but it's just not a good fit for the modern day. And I would like to take the time right now to say that those people are completely and entirely wrong. Especially this year, where a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game came out that was a beat-em-up game and everybody loved it, so I don't think what the naysayers are saying is actually true. Midnight Fight Express is also a beat-em-up game that is great in its own way. It is bursting at the seams with John Wick energy, plowing through waves and waves of enemies with an amazing soundtrack accompanying you along the way. The game is very simple, but it does those simple things with an aggressive feeling to everything. It's not like a double dragon or a final fight. It feels very different in how visceral every punch is. In the beginning, you have very simple moves, but you very quickly start to upgrade your character with more and more stuff. So before you know it, you're shooting guns, you're countering moves, you're throwing objects, you're jumping back and forth like it's a Batman Arkham game, you're dodge rolling, you're dealing these brutal finishers all on your own. There are no big elaborate cutscenes or quick time events and stuff like that. You're the one that's doing everything. And it feels amazing every time you pull something off that looks like it should be in a cutscene, but it's not. You're the one pulling it all off. The customization you can have for your player character and the different objectives you can go for by attempting the same levels multiple times really makes it feel like a more complete package. I can definitely see some places in this game that could have been replaced with like a battle pass or some free to play gotcha mechanic to squeeze money out of you. But it doesn't do that at all. It's unfortunately a rare sight to see these days, but this is just a full, complete experience that lets you unlock a ton of stuff without feeling the need to fork over more money. I had a great time playing this one, and it's slowly becoming one of those default games that I instinctively gravitate toward when I just want to kill some time or have something to play while I'm listening to a podcast or something. If you want to play something that makes you feel like a total unstoppable badass, but it is also a complete package, then I can't recommend Midnight Fight Express enough. 
And just like a lot of the games that are on this list, this game is also on Game Pass. So if you have Game Pass, then you're ready. Just download it and you're ready to go. Number three. Tunic, another game made mostly by one person, Tunic is truly an excellent video game and one of the best games I've played in a while, even beyond 2022. When you look at it, it might feel familiar to you. It has a little bit of Zelda, a little bit of Dark Souls, a little bit of this and that and a whole bunch of other stuff mixed into a blender to give you something that grows to be its own thing without leaning too heavily on its inspirations. One of the first things that people bring up about this game is two things. One is that it looks gorgeous. The art style is so beautiful, and I love just staring at this game longer than I would like to admit. It has that artsy indie game flavor, but in a good way that's not too pretentious or played out or predictable. Playing this on PC at the highest resolution and frame rate that I could get alongside a gamepad and a good set of headphones, it made this into one of those experiences that just takes you away to a totally different world. It just leaves you with your mouth half open with your bottom lip hanging down like a caveman over how immersed you can get from the atmosphere alone. I know this is a strange compliment to give this game because it should be obvious, but you'll know what I mean in a second. What I love the most about Tunic is that it never forgets that it's a video game. My favorite part of Tunic is that it's the most video game-ass video game I've played in a while. I feel like a lot of modern games these days get way too bogged down on trying to be cinematic experiences where the player is barely involved. And when you're actually playing, everything feels very hand-holdy and safe and tries to hide the UI as much as it can. It doesn't feel like the developers have any respect for the players or have any trust that they can figure stuff out on their own. It becomes a very passive experience when you're just waiting for the game to give you permission to do something cool after it finishes reading you like a whole audiobook about what's happening in the story while you slowly walk down a pretty looking hallway. Tunic, however, is the antithesis of all of those things. The moment you start the game, it just lets you wander around on your own. There are no instructions to start with, but when you do start finding pages of an instruction manual, it's written in a totally different language that you don't understand. So you just kind of have to do your best to figure out as much as you can on your own. It's kind of like when I was playing Dragon Quest X. It's a Japanese game that never came out in English, but I tried my best and I still managed to have a great time with it. And that's why I enjoy playing Japanese games so much. Figuring out ways to get over the language barrier is part of the fun for me, and Tunic is very good at evoking that same feeling. It doesn't talk down to you or treat you like an idiot. Everything is well designed to slowly ease you into the mechanics and hiking up the difficulty appropriately as you explore the world in front of you. It also encourages a lot of exploration, which is usually rewarded in awesome ways like finding a secret shop, finding a place to change the look of your character. And I've seen a bunch of like reviews and gameplay footage of this game and I never even knew that you could change the color of your little guy, but I just wandered into some secret place and I found it and that does just a really great feeling. It's super gratifying to discover that for your yourself. And of course you have the classic treasure chest that's full of money whenever you find a secret place. It's just so good man, it doesn't pretend to be something that is not, you know what I mean? It's not trying to be a Hollywood movie or trying his best to not be or look like a video game. It doesn't beat you over the head with audio logs or PowerPoint presentations explaining how you're supposed to be playing the game. It just lets you roam free and it allows the design of the world to speak for itself. And for a game that has no voices or dialogue, the level of quality that this game has is loud and clear. Tunic is excellent, and if there's any game out of this list of 10 that I think you can't end the year without, I would say that this is the one. If you have Game Pass, then you have no excuse. Go play this. Number 2, Xenoblade 3. Despite all of the praise I've been giving to games like Proteus, Hyper Demon, and Tunic, at the end of the day, I am a weeb at heart and it's always those pesky anime games that end up grabbing my interest the most. However, even if you're not into anime in the same way that I am, I think I feel pretty confident in recommending the Xenoblade series. I thought Xenoblade 1 was fantastic, and Xenoblade 2 was also amazing. With the arrival of Xenoblade 3, it had enormously high standards to live up to, and part of me was a little worried, Especially when Xenoblade 2 has more or less become the internet's favorite punching bag that always gets used to justify people's unjustified hatred for anime or hatred for attractive women existing in a video game. However, the people that do actually engage with these games in good faith always come out of it with an unforgettable experience, and Xenoblade 3 is no exception. Monolith Soft knocked it out of the park yet again with another fantastic Xenoblade game. 
I apologize if my comments regarding this game are super vague, but I would very much prefer you just go and play this game yourself. I wouldn't want to spoil a single second of this game for you beyond what they have already shown on like Nintendo Directs and stuff like that. Visually, it's beautiful. Music-wise, it's amazing. Gameplay-wise, it's so much more interesting and expansive than previous games. Even the UI just looks so much cooler now. The story, oh my god, this, the story's just so good. You can almost interpret the story as like a war between the Xenoblade 1 fan base and the Xenoblade 2 fan base if you want to joke about it. But yeah, you know, I say it in jest. It obviously goes so much deeper than that. It almost gives me like a Persona 3 vibe around the whole thing where like it talks a lot about death and all that kind of stuff. Persona 3 also tackled a lot of those themes and here it tackles it in its own way. And I'll say this much, when every single chapter of your game is like a separate trending topic on social media full of crying emojis, <laughs> then you know you're doing it right. And that's the main takeaway from Xenoblade 3. It just does everything right. Even on an underpowered console like the Switch, it still looks and plays great. If there's ever a Switch Pro that comes out with nicer specs, then this would be the first game that I would try out on it. If you thought that Monolith Soft couldn't do it better than Xenoblade 1 or 2, then wait until you play 3, because they find a way to make everything better, at least in my opinion. Every single little corner of this game is just so captivating and interesting, and just so well made. I could talk all day about how great this game is, but that would mean spoiling pretty much everything about it, including the ending. So needless to say, if you enjoy the previous Xenoblade games, then you would have nothing to worry about. Xenoblade 3 is just as good, if not better, than his predecessors, and you won't regret using your time on this wonderful game. And finally, we have Game of the Year number one, which is Vampire Survivors. I know it's really easy to have your choice for Game of the Year just be the obvious, popular AAA game with hyper-realistic graphics and Marvel MCU-style writing, and although I do believe that those kinds of games have a place in this industry, those were not the ones that I played or enjoyed the most. I needed to be true to myself. I had to be honest about what games I simply couldn't stop playing or thinking about. I was ruminating about that while I was on my 10 millionth run of Vampire Survivors, and then it hit me. Oh yeah, Vampire Survivors. It's a no-brainer. That is my game of the year. The moment that game came out, I never stopped. I loved it. It's super addicting, it's incredibly fun, and I just can't stop. Another game that was made by one guy that inspired a ton of other people to make their own rip-off version of it. And I guess that's how you know you made a good game these days when everyone on Steam scrambles to get a piece of that pie by copying your homework. Which, funnily enough, Vampire Survivors in and of itself is also a copy of someone else's homework. Because the gaming industry is just a giant community of money-hungry cloud chasers. But hey, I digress. That's a rant for another time. I'm sure all of you already know everything about this game, but I'll go ahead and say it again. Vampire Survivors is awesome, and it's awesome because of how simple it is. You basically just move around a map, and that's it. All the attacks are done for you. You could technically play this game with an Atari 2600 controller if you really wanted to. All you have to do is survive for 30 minutes, and then you win. But there's always an infinite amount of enemies that are constantly coming for you. So you have to stock up on weapons and upgrades and turn those measly little attacks into a force of destruction that destroys like a thousand enemies per second. And it is so satisfying to reach that point. The game is also full of unlockables and secret stuff to get, so you'll almost always have something new to play around with with every new run. It's so simple and it's so much fun. And now that the game is out on mobile devices, I'm gonna dedicate so much more time to it, unlocking everything again. And there's also DLC coming up as well, and I can't wait to get into it because it just adds more characters, more weapons, more levels, more music, more everything. Vampire Survivors has become my default game to play when I just want to kill some time and have fun. And I think that's really meaningful. You can have the most cinematic, movie-like experience out there, but the game part of it can be really generic and boring and uninspired, or it's just what you expect it to be, and you put it down forever after you're done with it. With a lot of the games I mentioned today, they try to do their own thing without pandering to whatever's modern or topical or making a lot of money. If they did, every single one of these games would just be a free-to-play live service. But sometimes all you need is something simple with genuinely good ideas and even more genuine people that bring those ideas to life. The AAAs, in my opinion, have done a horrible job at dissuading my cynicism about the industry this year. It seems like they're more interested in squeezing as much money out of you as humanly possible, 
while also being too cowardly to use any of that money on something more unique and creative. I feel like a lot of the big figureheads of the industry waste too much of their time calling everyone a Nazi on Twitter or trying to find validation through Hollywood bootlicking by trying to get big actors involved that clearly don't care at all about this art form. It's almost like everyone is embarrassed and ashamed to be a part of video games, so they try to promote and reward certain titles that try their best to not be like video games at all in order to impress a totally different industry that doesn't care at all about what we do. I could rant about this all day, but I just wanted to say that because that's the one thing that consistently bothered me throughout the entire year with all of these conferences and video game events. All of them seemingly were hosted by Jeff Keighley and all of them had this air of like, hey, we're cool because look at this actor, isn't that really nice? They just try to justify their own existence by trying to appeal to the popular kids in the other table of the cafeteria. And it just doesn't work. Imagine going to McDonald's and instead of getting a burger, like they really try to force you to eat like Mexican food, like tacos and stuff. It's like, no, dude, you're a burger joint, okay? Just embrace what you are. You're good at what you do. You don't have to be anything else. But I don't know. I just feel like the industry is just full of really insecure people that don't want video games to be video games because they just want to look cool in front of other people. But fortunately, it's always those smaller guys that give me hope. It's the Undertales, the Minecrafts, the One-Shots, the Vampire Survivors, the Tunics that always lift my spirits. There's clearly still a lot of creativity out there. It's just not the popular thing because influencers and the media don't really care about putting that kind of stuff on a pedestal. At least not until it starts making a ton of money to which then everybody runs as fast as they can to shamelessly steal the same ideas without understanding why anyone liked the original thing to begin with. But the fact that these tiny games can go so far with the limited resources that they have goes to show that despite all of its flaws, gaming is the best that it has ever been. And as long as we keep doing our best to promote and talk about games that truly deserve to be played outside of the typical AAA stuff, it is only going to get better because the big companies only care about making money. So if they see a lot of money being made elsewhere, they will smell that money out and just follow by example. So if you want things to get better, then just support the games that you like and don't support the ones that you don't. Just like Vampire Survivors, the moment it got popular, everybody started ripping it off. So if you want to see more people following the example of good games, then support those titles so that the bigger companies can follow suit. Because if you don't, you're just gonna be stuck walking and talking in a pretty looking hallway forever. Thank you very much for listening to me talk. 2022 was an insane year for me. It was full of highs and lows, some really happy times and some really depressing times. But I'm glad to say that everything ended up okay. Um, things really ended on a positive note with really nice, good, positive changes in my personal life and changes to the kind of dreams that I want to chase after. I think that's the big one in terms of like what personal projects and what, you know, passions I have now. So yeah, I, I really apologize for being gone for so long and I'm going to apologize again because my absence on YouTube will unfortunately continue. I feel like I haven't uploaded anything in like a year, but in reality, at the time of this recording, it's only been a month since my last podcast episode. But yeah, it's funny when you think about it. I feel like I haven't been on YouTube in forever, but in reality, it's only been a little while. I've actually had longer breaks than this, but for some reason, this one just felt particularly long, probably because I've just been so busy with other things. But yeah, the point of the matter is that I still have, and I always will have plans for other videos in the future, but the reality is that my priorities in life have shifted completely into other projects that have nothing to do with YouTube. Maybe someday you will see them, right? Maybe those projects will evolve into a YouTube video where I talk about it, but for now, I'm sorry if it takes forever for me to upload something new again. I am not really interested in Let's Plays, reactions, or even live streams anymore. So the next time I upload, I would prefer it to be something a bit more meaningful. Kind of like this video that you're watching right now, where it's scripted and edited and is a little bit more well put together. As opposed to something that I just fart out in 20 minutes and upload it. Currently, I am planning to make a video on One Piece Film Red, and then a video on Green Day Rock Band. This could very well change, but in case you're curious about what I'm working on, well, hey, those are the main things that I'm interested in at the moment. Of course, I'm always on Discord, so if those plans ever change, then the people on my Discord server will very likely be the first people to know. And that's pretty much everything I have to say. 
Thank you once again. I hope you have a great holiday season, and I will see you all again in the new year.